I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, protect civilians in Gaza. Top U.S. diplomat Antony Blinken brings that message to Israel as the seventh day of an extended truce comes to an end. A call to freedom. Congress pushes for the release of imprisoned Nicaraguan Bishop Rolando Alvarez. We have a report and reaction. Unpacking the polls. Analysis of the surprising impact Catholics have on Joe Biden's 2024 campaign. And Christmas time is here. A stunning view of the streets of Berlin to brighten your holiday shopping. These stories add more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Andrew the Apostle. Our top story tonight in the Middle East, a shaky truce holds for one more day. It allowed for six more hostages to be released by Hamas. Now the question remains if the truce will be extended for yet another day. Israeli officials estimate that Gaza militants still hold around 30 women and children, more than 100 men. Well, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is back in the Middle East. He is urging Israeli leaders to respect international law as it battles Hamas terrorists in Gaza. President Joe Biden's top diplomat reiterated the U.S. remains committed to supporting Israel's right to self-defense so that October 7th never happens again. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Israeli leaders discussing hostages and humanitarian aid. He said his immediate focus right now is to extend the pause to get more hostages out of Gaza and more assistance in, adding there are many families whose loved ones are still being held captive. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken sitting down with Israeli President Isaac Herzog in Tel Aviv. The secretary saying that from day one... We have been focused relentlessly on trying to secure the release of hostages from, uh, from Gaza and from Hamas. Those hostages, some 240 of them, taken by Hamas during the brutal October 7th attack on Israel that ignited the current war. Today, Secretary Blinken also offering his condolences to the victims of a shooting carried out by two gunmen who opened fire on a bus station in Jerusalem, killing at least three people. The suspect shot dead at the scene by two soldiers, Hamas claiming responsibility. As you said, we're reminded yet again by the events in Jerusalem today of the threat from terrorism that uh, Israel and Israelis face every single day. Secretary Blinken also meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, saying the U.S. will continue support for Israel's right to protect itself, but urged Israel to take every possible measure to avoid civilian harm. According to the Hamas-controlled health ministry in Gaza, which does not differentiate between civilians and combatants, more than 13,000 Palestinians have been killed since the war began. And Secretary Blinken meeting with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas as well, focusing on efforts to increase the delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza and condemning Jewish settler attacks against Palestinians in the West Bank. And back at the White House in the press briefing room, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby tells reporters. And so we're going to continue our efforts with Israel, with Qatar, um, obviously with Egypt, to support and extend this pause as, as much as we can and to help secure the release of all the hostages held by Hamas terrorists. Now, while in Israel, Secretary Blinken also commented today on former Secretary Henry Kissinger, who just passed away at age 100, saying he was very privileged to get Kissinger's counsel many times, adding Kissinger was extraordinarily generous with his wisdom, with his advice, and that few people were better students of history. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, as Owen just mentioned, tributes are pouring in worldwide today following the death of Henry Kissinger. He passed away at his Connecticut home late last night. Kissinger leaves behind a legacy spanning decades in American foreign policy. CNN's John Lorenz has more. I have never dealt with a group of people as treacherous as the North Vietnamese leadership. Henry Kissinger once said power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. And he would have known. After escaping Nazi Germany in his childhood, Kissinger would become one of the most powerful figures in politics during the Richard Nixon administration. Kissinger provided uh, a genius for multi-level, playing multi-level diplomatic chess, which allowed uh, the U.S. government and the Nixon administration to implement Nixon's policies, the most famous of which, of course, was the opening to China. 
Kissinger was criticized by some for his decision to increase U.S. military action during the Vietnam War. I would then recommend that you start bombing the Vegeta Islands and the Islands. Kissinger received the 1973 Nobel Peace Prize for his work in helping arrange the end of the U.S. military's involvement in the Vietnam War. Henry Kissinger was a towering figure uh, in U.S. foreign relations. Um, both admired and hated. Kissinger was 100 years old. All right, we go now to Dr. Paul Kengor, professor of political science at Grove City College. Paul, great to have you back on. Uh, you just wrote a piece about Henry Kissinger for the National Catholic Register. In it, you say he was a legend in foreign policy, whether you feel that impact as positive or negative, for better or for worse. Talk to us more about that. Yeah, it's really true. In fact, those uh, those two packages that you just played, I mean, he was he was reviled by a lot of people. I mean, I guess loathed and loved. I mean, people felt that he was terrible in Vietnam, good on Vietnam. I mean, among the things he did in Vietnam. So, yeah, he wanted to increase uh, weapons there because he, he and Richard Nixon wanted us to withdraw from honor as they put it. So they felt that we didn't lose on the ground in Vietnam. So they felt that it shouldn't look like we were retreating once we were leaving. We wanted to leave. We wanted to get out of there, but we weren't defeated. So the key was to retreat with honor in a way that looked like that, that we weren't defeated because we weren't. So, I mean, it was that kind of nuance, you know, very skillful work that he did in foreign policy on China, so many other issues. I mean, Richard Nixon is known as this president who was like a kind of a foreign policy genius as a president. And the guy behind him, in many respects, was uh, was Henry Kissinger. He was definitely one of the most influential voices in foreign policy. I'd say, Tracy, not just in the 20th century or even the 1970s, but really in the, in the history of America. Yeah, and Paul, I want to talk about this now, his connection to the Catholic Church and his relationship uh, with multiple popes. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, and, and here, here's where I'll level of criticism, okay? So I think what what Kissinger pursued with Richard Nixon, with Nixon's successor, Gerald Ford, those are two Republicans, and then following that came Jimmy Carter, who was a Democrat. All of those 1970s presidents, they pursued this idea of detente with the Soviets. And the idea was, we need to learn to get along with the Soviets. They're going to be around forever. We should trade with them. We should have treaties with them. We should lessen the likelihood of nuclear war. And unfortunately, that means that we need to accept the so-called detente status quo in Eastern Europe, which means that you cede Eastern Europe to this so-called Soviet sphere of influence. And this was the kind of realpolitik, Machiavellian sort of posturing that Kissinger and and Nixon and Gerald Ford and also even Jimmy Carter did in foreign policy. Now, the, the guys who changed this were Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II. And I should add, Pope Paul VI, who was, who was pope while Kissinger was in office in the 1970s, he also pursued this sort of detente. It was called os politique when he did it. So, so Nixon and, and Paul VI were together on this detente, os politique, kind of accommodating the Soviets. Well, then later come Reagan and John Paul II, and they said, no, 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 that's wrong. That's immoral because it puts all these people behind the Iron Curtain under the jackboot of Soviet communism. We should be liberating those people. We should be rolling back communism. We should be defeating communism, not in an aggressive way, not with nuclear war, but peacefully. And uh, and that was the breakthrough, the, the break from um, you know, Kissinger, Nixon policy in the 70s to even Reagan and John Paul II in the 1980s. And the latter policy you know, won the Cold War. We have about a minute left, Paul. Um, but quickly, what do you think his legacy will be? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I'd say along with Nixon opening China to the West and just overall being this you know, constant presence on the scene for I mean, almost 50 years, right? No, no, I mean, more than 50 years, going back to 1969. And at one point, Tracy, I mean, he was both uh, Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. Now, in most administrations, those two positions are pitted against one another, but um, Kissinger actually had both positions. So uh, he was a very powerful man, a very powerful, as well as um, you know, thoughtful foreign policy voice. Yeah, he certainly was. Dr. Paul Kangor, always great to be with you. Thank you so much for your time. Sure thing. Thanks, Tracy.
Well, the plight of a jailed church leader in Nicaragua continues to gain attention on Capitol Hill. Bishop Rolando Alvarez has been under arrest since 2022, charged with treason by President Daniel Ortega. The communist government says the bishop is safe and healthy. Many, however, have their doubts. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has been following this story for us and joins us now with the very latest. Eric. Good evening, Tracy. Yes, the communist regime recently posted a picture, and pictures, that is, of Bishop Rolando Alvarez sitting at a table, even having dinner with his family uh, when he's behind bars, showing that he's alive. You know, the communist regime actually even says that he is receiving preferential treatment. But Catholic Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey and several others up here on Capitol Hill say it is all a big lie. This is an urgent appeal to Ortega to release and let Bishop Alvarez go. Congressman Chris Smith chaired a global human rights hearing focused on the imprisonment of Bishop Rolando Alvarez, who's been sentenced to 26 years. He's a walking saint. He bears no malice. Uh, he stands for principle and he's immovable, but he has no malice towards Ortega or his wife. Uh, I mean, he, he is living the gospel of loving even those uh, who persecute. During the hearing, Catholic priests who served under the bishop gave emotional testimony of their own time behind bars. They blackmailed me and threatened the lives of my relatives because they wanted me to declare that the bishop was a member of an organization that wanted to promote a coup d'etat against Daniel Ortega and that he received money from the U.S. government and the European Union. Juan Chamorro sat in a Nicaraguan prison cell for 20 months for simply running against Ortega in a presidential election. When he was released, he was banned from returning to the country. Now in the U.S., he tells me the bishop is living in horrific conditions at La Modelo prison. But La Modelo was built in the 60s. Uh, he's under uh, solitary confinement in a very narrow place. Uh, they call it the little hell. He adds the pictures of the bishop enjoying food with family in an earlier video showing a TV and a sofa are from a cell that doesn't exist. That's manipulation and that's a cruel treatment of uh, Monsignor Alvarez. Uh, he looked very frail, very weak, uh, thin, and we are really worried and concerned uh, for his health. The U.S. Bishops' Conference has been outspoken since the arrest of Bishop Alvarez, stating, quote, the consensus from the international community is clear. The continued incarceration of Bishop Alvarez is unjust and must end as soon as possible. Congressman Smith says that he's even written President Ortega to get permission to be able to visit Bishop Alvarez, but those requests have fallen on deaf ears. He is calling on the Biden administration to impose tougher sanctions and even remove trade agreements. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. And for more now, we turn to Christina Halcrum, legal counsel for Latin America for Alliance Defending Freedom International and the lead lawyer on the bishop's case. Christina, great to have you back on. First off, what stood out the most to you today uh, from the hearings and what do you hope comes from it? What stood out the most for us was the concern that Nicaraguan nationals and the international community show for Bishop Alvarez. The bishop has certainly become a symbol of the persecution that people of faith have to endure in Nicaragua. And Christina, so many questions and concerns over Bishop mm -hmm. Alvarez's well-being. What do you know about his health and the conditions in which he's being kept. Yes, reliable sources confirm that his health conditions are dire, and so much so that the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights have ordered Nicaragua to guarantee his right to health. ADF International is now submitting a petition to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights requesting his immediate release and the protection and guarantee of all his human rights. And Christine, we heard, you know, there are calls from the Biden administration to do more to secure Bishop Alvarez's re release. Uh, what do you think of the White House and the international community's response so far? It could be stronger. U.S. Congress could urge um, the, this administration and ambassador at large for international religious freedom to prioritize diplomatic efforts to end the persecution in Nicaragua and to um, let Bishop Alvarez go. And of course, he is not the only Catholic figure that's being targeted uh, by the Ortega regime. Talk to us more about that and what's happening down there. Yes, the church right now in Nicaragua is being really careful. They are not free to worship. They are not free to pray out loud for their pastors. 
Um, as you know, 12 priests were recently, last month, expelled into Rome just because preaching on, on human dignities and in God-given freedoms. The Nicaraguan authorities are getting rid of any pastors that preach on freedom, freedom and denounce their injustices. Christina, where do you think this is all going? And what do you think will happen uh, if more isn't being done? Well, the church is going to become more silent um, every day passing. So we really need advocates, true advocates that want to um, want to protect religious freedom and, and want to advocate for religious freedom to speak louder. And Christina, thank you so much for coming on today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including Faith on the Ballot, a new study about white Catholic voters and how it could decide the next election. If I leave, they win. If I leave, the bullies take place. This is bullying. On the eve of a vote to expel him, Congressman George Santos remains defiant. We have the details ahead. a debate on a motion to expel embattled Republican George Santos. Before that, the New York congressman lashed out. This will haunt them in the future where mere allegations are sufficient to have members removed from office when duly elected by their people in their respective states. Now, Congressman Santos is pushing an expulsion effort against Congressman Jamal Bowman of New York. The Democrat was caught on camera pulling a fire alarm inside the Capitol. A vote to expel Congressman Santos is scheduled for tomorrow. The resolution requires a two-thirds majority. Well, this week, President Biden made a campaign stop in Colorado, stumping on the successes and investments of the Inflation Reduction Act. His trip comes as his poll numbers and support continue to wane. But how does President Biden, the second Democrat Catholic president in U.S. history, appeal to the Catholic base, a group that was virtually split 50-50 in the 2020 election? Here to talk about the data behind the Catholic vote is Dr. Ryan Burge, political science professor at Eastern Illinois, who recently released an article on his graphs about religion entitled The Myth of the White Catholic Democrat on Substack. Dr. Burge, great to be with you today. All right, let's just jump right into this. What would you say is the big myth? Yeah, the big myth is that white Catholics are, are Democrats. I mean, I think it goes back to John Kennedy. Uh, we kind of have this idea in our eyes of a white Catholic, Northeastern, you know, liberal supporting, uh, you know, constituency. But if you look over the last 40 years or so, that's not been true at all. And in the 1970s, two-thirds of white Catholics were Democrats. Today, it's only 36 percent of white Catholics are Democrats. 21 percent were Republicans in 1972. It's 44 percent are Republicans uh, now. So, you know, the idea that they, they used to be Democrats, but over the last 30 or 40 years, the average white Catholic now is clearly right of center when it comes to politics. Yeah. And why do you think that happened? Why such a significant drop off? Yeah. So, you know, white Christians generally have moved to the right over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, that's happened amongst white evangelicals. Uh, people forget this, but even in the 1980s, if you walked into a white evangelical church, you were just as likely to sit next to a Republican as you were a Democrat in like 1988. Same in the, in the white Catholic church. But what's happened is white voters have drifted to the right over time. Uh, and that's been true amongst all Christians. And I think Catholics have been sort of caught up in that. And in the last couple of years, I think it's been accelerated quite a bit by what we call the God gap or the Pew gap, which is the idea that the Republican party has become the party of people of faith. And and the Democratic Party is increasingly the party of non-religious Americans. 45% of Joe Biden's voters in 2020 were atheists, agnostics, or nothing in particular. So a lot of white Christians have, have vacated the party because they just don't see it as being uh, very amenable to their views. You know, I'm curious, what about abortion? I mean, does this play into any of all this? Yeah, it's hard to know, you know, what is the causal mechanism for, for each individual voter. But, you know, if you look back, Roe versus Wade happened in 1973, and you see the, the Democratic share drop consistently from 1973 forward. Now, it's hard to know if that's doing all the work here. It's definitely doing some of the work, but also part of the work may be generational replacement, too. That is, older white Catholics died off and were replaced by younger white Catholics who might be a little more right of center than their parents or grandparents were. And that might be moving the trend line to the right generally speaking. I know in your article, uh, you also say that white count, the white Catholic vote, that is, may be one of the most consequential voting blocks in the modern political landscape. Why is it? And what do you think candidates need to do to win the vote? 
Yeah, so you got to think about the white. There's about 20% of Americans are white Catholic. About a quarter of Americans generally are Catholic. And what's interesting about the Catholic Church is it's everywhere. I mean, in every possible state, every battleground state, every not battleground state, there are Catholics there. Um, the one thing that we see, and one of the biggest movements we see in the last couple of years is a defection, especially amongst Hispanic voters from the Democratic Party, especially amongst Hispanic Catholics. If you break Hispanic Catholics down by mass attendance, what you see is for those who attend mass every month, every week or more than once a week, they moved 15 to 20 points toward Donald Trump between 2016 and 2020. I think the culture war rhetoric that's happening right now is drawing in a lot of more conservative Catholics, socially conservative Catholics, and pushing out a lot of more liberal Catholics towards the Democratic Party. The Republican Party continues to talk about social issues, which that, that's that been a successful thing for them so far. The Democratic Party's got to figure out how to, uh, how to be a party of people who are atheists, black Protestant, Muslim, and Catholic. Catholic, and that's a hard thing to do to keep all those people under your tent at one time. We have 30 seconds left, uh, but how do you see the Catholic vote trending in 2024? Yeah, so I think white Catholics are going to continue to trend towards Donald Trump. I mean, if he obviously think he's a presumptive nominee in 2024. I think really what we're seeing is that the non-white Catholics are where this election is going to be won and lost. States like Arizona, which was very close in 2020, might go the other way in 2024 if Hispanic Catholics turn out in large number for Donald Trump in 2024. So I think we're looking at younger non-white voters, especially religious voters, who typically trend towards the Democrats, have actually shifted towards the Republicans over the last several years. And that's Definitely good news for Donald Trump. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Dr. Burge, great to be with you. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Have a good day. Well, as world leaders gather at the 28th Annual United Nations Climate Summit in Dubai, there is concerning news from the U.N.'s weather agency. They say 2023 is all but certain to be the hottest year on record. The World Meteorological Organization reports the average temperature is up some 1.4 degrees from pre-industrial times. That means we will likely be seeing more heat waves, floods, and forest fires. The WMO Secretary General warns this worrying trend will continue into 2024. We are heading towards 2.5 to 3 degrees warming. And that would mean that we would see massively more uh, ne negative impacts of climate change. And uh, actually, we have already lost this uh, glacier melting and sea level rise game that may continue for the coming thousands of years. But uh, also there, we could uh, have lower numbers of sea level rise uh, if we are able to limit uh, emissions uh, fairly soon. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, signs of extremism. Russia's Supreme Court announces a major decision on LGBTQ activism. We have the details. Plus, it may still be November, but one of Berlin's most famous avenues is ready to go for Christmas. We'll tell you all about it. A major decision by Russia's Supreme Court saying the LGBTQ plus movement is extremist. The court ruling followed a justice ministry lawsuit from earlier this month. The suit alleged that authorities had identified dangerous signs, including, quote, incitement of social and religious discord. Opponents of the decision claim this would allow Russia to crack down on any individual suspected of being an activist. A civil war has put a Catholic cathedral complex in southern Asia in the crossfire. The pastoral center of Christ the King in Myanmar is now occupied by the Burmese military. Refugees fleeing the fighting had taken shelter there until an airstrike caused massive damages. No one was reportedly killed in the blast. New developments tonight in the health of the Holy Father. Pope Francis reveals that he has very acute infectious bronchitis. Recuerdo los hijos. De esa voluntaria de las jornadas que murió en el trabajo. Still, the Holy Father kept a busy schedule, meeting with people who had participated in World Youth Day. He revealed his health condition in another gathering, this one with health professionals. Pope Francis had to cancel his trip to Dubai, scheduled for tomorrow. Well, it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas for shoppers in Berlin. With a flick of a switch, one of the city's most famous avenues, Kurs von Dom Street, was transformed into a winter wonderland. 500 trees, 140,000 flashing lights, and thousands of decorations are all on display, giving shoppers a magical experience. Beautiful. Well, finally tonight, we are drawing close to an unveiling of another kind in France. The outline of the iconic spire at Notre Dame Cathedral is once again visible 
Amid the skyline of Paris, a church remains mostly in scaffolding following the devastating fire in 2019. However, officials say the work on the spire should be done in time for Christmas. Well, thank we, we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.